Hey, everybody, want to welcome you to the Matrix discussion group call. And we're having kind of an extra episode here this week. We've got Micah Dank back with us again. And I, I've really come to find that it seems like there are so many things that are presented to us in life that, you know, should be obvious, but for some reason they're not. Maybe part of the reason is they're too obvious. Uh, what's the saying? You can't see the forest for the trees. And I think that's what happens a lot of times. And I, I think a big part of it as well, when I talk to different people that are, say, in the maybe Christian group, if you want to categorize it as that, is that people it really get stuck back in Sunday school. They never graduate past that. And the church definitely hasn't helped them grow past that either, which is a serious issue. And so, you know, they've been kept ignorant and kind of left with their Sunday school doctrine, and they don't believe a whole lot much different now than they did when maybe they were 12 years old in church. And with a lot of the information that Michael Dank has brought out uh, regarding, say, like the Zodiac symbol and the signs within that, like, all really point to things that people should be paying attention to that Micah has brought up, but I'm not sure that people do. And in the same in vain, you find that church don't talk about the Maseroth either. And how many so-called Christian people even know what the Maseroth is? Because that is nothing more than even an older symbology of the Zodiac symbol that the Hebrews followed. And uh, yes, anything you want to add with that, Micah? That's pretty much it. Maseroth literally translates to Zodiac. Um, the word Maseroth is an incredibly old word. I'm not even going to venture to guess how old it is, to be honest with you. But over time, the word Maseroth has evolved, and it becomes the word Maseroth. And then that evolves even further down the road to the words Mazeltov. You know what that means. Everyone knows what Mazeltov means. It's what the Jewish people say to each other. It literally translates to good fortune from the stars, and you can see just how old Mazeltov is. You can imagine how old Maseroth is. Well, even if we go back to uh, the book of Job, uh, you're going to find scripture in Job where it's being the told, you know, oh, where were you when I set the foundations of the earth? You know? The book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. See, the book of Job <clears throat> is the oldest book in the Bible. You would think Genesis is, right? It's not. Um, the book of Job is. In 100 AD, they had a synod at Jamnia, Israel, where a bunch of rabbis got together and they canonized the Old Testament. Because believe it or not, by 100 AD, this is 30 years after the Gospel of Mark came out. This is 30 years after the Second Temple. They had a synod where they canonized the Bible and put the books in order. The book of Job is the oldest book. And Nazareth is the oldest word in the Bible. Yeah, your um, audio is getting faint again there, Micah. Sorry. So it's, Hold on. Does this I, help if I turn this off? No, that doesn't make any difference. I don't know what it is, but I, I know it like illuminates your screen when you were the one talking. And a couple times there, it went back and illuminated mine. I wasn't even saying anything, but hey, that's the fun of technology nowadays, right? And uh, where, where do we think we got this technology from? You know, <laughs> um, and I find it amazing if you go back and, and research the amount of technology that's come out, say, between the years of like 1947 and 1951. Roswell. There is, oh yeah, there is so much there. People have no idea. Even like the touch screen that came out in that time period. Well, what we yeah. think is cutting edge, what we think is cutting edge technology today, like the most cutting edge, the stuff that like they just put out there is actually 30 years older than what we actually truly have behind the scenes. And what you'll find is after Roswell, you'll find that an enormous amount of brand new technology started speeding its way through. Yeah, there, there was the Roswell incident at that time. And also, one of the things that's not talked about much right prior to that time as well was the Babylon Working Project occurred. And they were even asked because there was a lot of crazy criminal things going on at that time. 
and they were even asked, you know, do you guys think you had anything to do with this? And I don't remember. I, I think it was um, maybe a uh, gentleman from Jet Propulsion Laboratories there. <laughs> Actually, maybe he said, yeah, I think maybe we did. You know? uh, so who knows? But I think there was a lot of things that happened right at that time that uh, if you want to say maybe kind of sliced through the veil and brought information to people, much like, say, Genesis 6, when it was talked about there, or the, the so-called fall of the angels, what happened there, it, because people were being taught new things. And a lot of things they were taught, like agriculture and um, uh, building equipment and writing, some of those things, I was like, wait a minute, why would the God be upset that people were learning these things? This is part of progression. These things will make me better. Things. What you're talking about right now is the morals of the story of Adam and Eve. Right. And, you know, when I, when I look, you look at the Bible overall, and a lot of people want to pick out certain things and say that, oh, this is symbolic or this is literal, and they jump back and forth between that and, and then say, they'll tell you, oh, well, you're not, you're misinterpreting it and things like that. I think when you stand back and look at the big picture of it, that the whole book is a blueprint from something that had happened thousands of years earlier. And it, it was just a way of it being presented to the people in a way that they could digest it or comprehend it. Right. I mean, I talk about the fact that the Bible is an astrology book. It's an etymology book. It's a gematria numerology book. It's a mythology book. It's an esoteric book. There's all these different holy sciences. That, it's an anatomical book. There's all these different holy sciences that are embedded into the Bible. The Bible itself is the most deep, and I'm talking 10-dimensional deep book ever written. I just teach the astrology, and I took it took me twelve years to learn that. Um, but the Bible is all these magical sciences put together. But the thing about the Bible that you don't realize, people don't realize, is that it's actually not original. So it is the greatest book ever written, but it is not original. You'll find the Ten Commandments and the 42 positive affirmations of Moth in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. You'll find three of the Ten Commandments in the chapter 125 of the Egyptian Book of the Dead. You can literally open it up and find it right there. The story of Noah and the Ark goes back to Gilgamesh. Um, there's all these stories that go back and they're predetermined. A lot of it comes from Egypt. For example, um, Moses, right? Wasn't a real person. He's based on them. These are Jungian archetypes that they place in the Bible to represent them. Moses goes back to the name Tuthmos, which is where he got his name, which was from Egypt. And Moses is entirely based on Akhenaten. Now, who was Akhenaten? Akhenaten was a special pharaoh who moved everybody away from their multiple gods and brought them all to one god. They believe it or not, the Old Testament tells you that Abraham, the Abrahamic religions, are the first monotheistic ones. They're not. Akhenat, 1367 AD, brought Egypt under the one God, and they worshiped the God. In fact, Leonos was the king of a Christian before the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. And what you'll find is that Greek that literally translates to sun worship. They were sun worship. Uh, just like all the ancient gods were the sun, so we Jesus. Yeah, and it's the same thing if you go and look, for instance, and I think I've even heard you probably mention it before, but Abraham and, and Sarah. Right. And those stories go back to India. And if you take and originally he wasn't called Abraham, he was called Abram. Abram. And well, if Abram, you go into this. Abram is multi layered. Abram is a combination of two Hebrew words A B and R A M. A B is short for Abba. Abba in Hebrew means father. Right. And R A M is Ram. And in Hebrew, that's Ram, Father Ram. The Jews are the people of Aries, the Ram. That's why his name was Abram. But Abraham and Sarah go back to Brahma and Sarah 
Or you forget that the Hindus are just as old as the Jews. People seem to forget that. Yes, this goes, and this goes back even older. Uh, you brought up the Book of the Dead. And I, I would recommend people go and look at some of these books because these books came out way before. Uh, I think the Book of the Dead was supposedly 6,000 B.C. If you look at the Enuma Elish, that was 14,000 B.C. Mm -hmm. And that, Now, when you say Book of the Dead at 6,000 B.C., you're looking at, say, for instance, the Old Testament is claimed to have been, I believe, around 3,500 B.C. So you're looking at almost another 3,000 years older than even the Old Testament was. But also, you know, you're going to get the majority of your info, really, if you go and study the Emerald Tablets. Mm -hmm. The Emerald Tablets came out 36,000 B.C., exactly. And um, uh, even about the, the, the tablets, tablets of creation. Are, Brian, you know what the interesting thing about the Emerald Tablets are? You're talking about... So the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, also known as Hermes Trismegistus, the quantum Hermetica. What did string theory figure out 20 years ago? And everything vibrates, everything is strings, everything vibrates, everything resonates, right? The right. third hermetic principle that's 6,000 years old says is the principle of vibration, that nothing rests, everything vibrates. They knew this science thousands and thousands of years ago. And quantum physicists are patting themselves on their back because they're figuring it out now. Yeah. And, you know, and you go and look in the Emerald Tablets and you're going to find so many things that it's like, oh my gosh, this seems familiar. That's why many times I've recommended to people, go read the extra biblical text. There's reasons why the churches don't want you reading them. And the reason why is because you're going to find out where they got their info from. Correct. If you go in and read like the Emerald Tablets from Toth, you're going to find in there, what's he referred to as? He's referred to as the scribe of gods. He's also referred to as the good savior. Mm -hmm. uh, gosh, does that not sound a little bit familiar? And even, you know, there, there's some other lines that you're going to find in some of these books. I was going through uh, a few weeks ago, the Luma Elish, and there was things in there, like, sounds familiar, from Genesis 126, about uh, making man in our own image. Or in Ephesians, it talked well, about, you know, Brian, we are workmen, Brian, we are ordained. You brought up a good point. Brian, you brought up a good point. What is Bereshit bara Elohim et HaShemayim ve'ed Haaretz, the first line of the Bible in Hebrew, mean? In the beginning... The gods, plural, created heaven and earth. Then yeah. they say, let us make man in our image. And people just scan right over it. People just scan right over it. And, you know, it, that's one of the scriptures that's often brought up when it's talking about, you know, numerous gods. And uh, Michael Heiser has even brought up... Um, I believe it was in Psalms, Psalms 82, talks about standing amongst the council of the gods or the divine council. And in fact, uh, Aluma Elish, you're going to find the divine council also in that book as well. But if you go, and I just went and did a quick scan through scriptures, and um, I don't have them all memorized, so I'm not going to read them all to you. But you can just do a scan through scriptures looking for when it talked about multiple gods. And it's not just in Genesis 1, but it's also in Genesis 3. It's in Exodus chapters 20 and 23, and chapter 12. It's in Numbers uh, chapter 33, numerous times in Psalms. Uh, like I said, chapter 82, uh, also in chapter 29, chapter 95, chapter 97, chapter 96, chapter 135, chapters 86. I mean, all through scripture you're going to see mention of multiple gods and one of the things that makes me kind of laugh to myself is that wait a minute if there really is only one god there's no other gods in existence only one god why would there be any need for a religion well it goes even further than that okay why would the one god be a jealous god right because there's one god amongst many gods you know, it's funny. I was talking to my good friend, Missy, 
um, who you should talk to because she's very bright. Um, and she told me when we were talking about a very similar thing that um, there are many gods and the one that we pray to, right, or the one that everyone supposedly prays to is a god against sacrifice. See, what happens is, here's, here's, here's how this works. In the Old Testament at the beginning, there was child sacrifice. You talk about Abraham and Isaac. Abraham, with faith, goes to sacrifice, gets stopped by the angel, right? And um, he's stopped by the angel. And what happens is, um, from that moment forward, child sacrifice was no longer needed. It was a test. So what that then did was it moved the sacrifice from children to animals. And now in the Bible, they talk about it all the time. You know how they say, give me a goat, give me a sheep, give me a bull. Well, the bull is Taurus, the sheep is Aries, and the goat is Capricorn. They give you these animals all the time. Sometimes they'll say donkey, that's a Celis borealis, that's in Cancer. Sometimes they'll say uh, a camel or a leopard, that's camelopardalis, that's in Gemini. These make patterns in the sky. These are celestial patterns. What happens then is there's animal sacrifice to atone for wrongdoings. What then happens is when you get to the New Testament, Jesus, taking the sins of the world and dying on the cross, removes the need from child sacrifice, removes the need from animal sacrifice. Suddenly it's him. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. But what happens is when you're talking about the original God, it's one God among many that you worship and he is a jealous God. So you better worship the right one. That's why three of the Ten Commandments are about you shall not make graven images. You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. He is a jealous God. But there is no child sacrifice anymore. And that's what everything goes on. In. Um, child sacrifice is what we see um, with the elites this day with adrenochrome you see that with babies that are you know this whole thing with um late-term abortion what they're doing is they're delivering these babies okay and they're telling them that it's killed because you don't get a bag with body parts saying this is your abortion what they do is they deliver them they live and then they get sold into the market for this, these children are born without birth certificates or social security cards so they can be harvested and used for sexual pleasure. This is what you're seeing. It's always about child sacrifice. Right. And, and you know, you go even, and I, like you talked about Jealous Scott, what I really recommend to people is look at the attributes. You know, look at the attributes, for instance, of the spirit that you're supposed to have. Do you see included in there anywhere being jealous or anything like that? No, you're not going to see that. And, and you go into the Old Testament and look at how many times over and over again, there seemed to be this thing about the sacrifice of the firstborn. You know, what's that all about? Does, does that really sound like something that your creator would be about? Uh, he's right. about creating things, not about destroying things. Right. You can't pray to that. And it's always about what do they do at the Bohemian Grove with Moloch? It's the effigy of a child. Now, in the 80s, they actually used to use real children. And there's a book written by a guy named Kevin Collins or Michael Scherter. I forget who it is. The Franklin cover up that goes into detail about this. But this is what it is. It's always about child sacrifice. It's always about taking something pure and destroying it. Right. And, when, and this even goes, like we were talking about uh, early on, this goes back to uh, Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard with uh, Babylon working in the desert. This was about the creation of a child. So many things all go back to children. I mean, I, I find it pretty amazing. And when we're looking through a lot of these older books, some of these texts that I mentioned, that are much thousands and thousands of years older than what even the scriptures are. There's just so many things that you find that resonate exactly, almost word for word, verbatim, from what 
you're going to find in the scriptures. So it's like, okay, who wrote this first? Where is this really coming from? And I, I would surmise that what happened with the scripture is that this was a very much older story, but written in a way that would be more palatable to the people of that time. That's yes. one of the reasons why I say that we need to put our feet in the sandals of the people back then to comprehend what was going on. Well, because even at that credit though, it's, it's a give or take. Remember we have technology now that they didn't have back then. They had things like archaeoacoustics and things that we're just learning about now, tuning forks, things of that nature. When you're talking about um, things of that nature that they had, for example, you know the biblical passage that says you shall not mix fabrics, wool and poly wool and um, linen. Right. There was a study done um, recently where they measured the resonance frequency of certain linens. Okay. Now your normal body on this scale gives off at about five thousand. Okay. Organic cotton is the 5,000 as well, okay? Um, things like polyester resonates at zero. Now, things like um, cotton and linen, for example, they both resonate high in tune with your aura. But what happens is when you mix the fabrics together, it cancels out. And when you wear these fabrics that you're not supposed to wear, and you wear them, it brings your whole spiritual and psychological system down. And they don't want you to know this, but they knew this in the ancient days. Why were the pyramids built at 111 hertz frequency? Why is the ancient Sumerians king list add up to 432,432 as a harmonic frequency? Why does it do all this? Why they knew this stuff? Why is the eye of Horus a spitting image of a sagittal cut of the pineal gland? Why did they know all this? So it is a give or take. You have to understand, too, is that the punishments that were doled out in the Bible, you know, you shall be put to death or you shall pay this or you shall do this or you shall bequeath this, things of that nature, were taken from the Code of Hammurabi. It's a dated system. Maybe you shouldn't be put to death for wearing two fabrics, but there is a very real science behind why you should. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Like you said, you're canceling out actually the vibration, the own, your own personal frequency that you have. And you look back over the past couple of years, what they want people to do. They want people separating by six feet. Why? Because that was the aura. That's the distance your aura goes out from around you. And also riding on that aura isn't just like your frequency, but also riding on that frequency it's will be your some of your, right. Your hormones, some of your hormones will also ride on that. Uh, that's why some people, when they meet, they're immediately like turned on by each other. Uh, you feel totally different than just meeting somebody else or a different female or different male, whichever your persuasion may be. But that, that's one of the reasons why that happens is because that's being put out there. And what do they want to do? They, they want to negate that as much as possible. I found one of the things to me that was fascinating, if you go through and read some of these books, and for instance, like the Emerald Tablets, as Micah mentioned, one of the things you're going to find is that Toph, when he came and set up, I'll just say he set up shop in the Middle East, all right? And he claims he is the one that built the pyramids. And what did he do? He, he told his from workers, he told his... down, nonetheless, from the top down. Right. Yeah. He told his guys, okay, I want you to spread out among the nations. Does that sound familiar? He said, I want you to go out and spread among the nations, and I want you to help spread some of this technology and teach people and help people. And he said, and at the same time when you do that, go ahead and put your mark on those people. You know, this whole like in vitro fertilization and the changing of DNA and splicing, this is nothing new. It's maybe kind of new to us. But it's something that this species with amnesia is just starting to catch back up with again. So if we're talking about DNA splicing, for example, you should look into something called the chromosome 2 anomaly. What the chromosome 2 anomaly is basically this. The second chromosome, and we have 23 of them, most people, unless you're uh, Down syndrome or 
something of that nature. Most people have 23 chromosomes. The second one is 35% larger than the rest. And you know how they're horseshoe shaped? In right. the middle, it's fused together like it has been edited. We have strands of DNA. Our DNA is 12 strands because it matches up with the flower of life. If you've ever taken a cut of the DNA, a vertical cut of the DNA, and you looked at it, it is the flower of life, which is sacred harmonics, which is um, sacred geometry. Um, the other thing you'll realize, too, is in the Bible, they talk about how man's years will be limited to 120. But before then, men lived longer. How is that possible? Well, it's called gene editing. See, I don't know if you've ever gone into deep research, Brian, into telomeres. But what telomeres are are basically caps on top of your DNA. Yep. And what happens is they degrade over time. Now, you can't stop them from degrading, but you can slow them down. And what the telomeres do is when the telomeres wear out, that is when the death process begins in a human body. So it happens at different spans of time. Those were added in order to shorten our lifespans. Yeah, and that's I believe that's even spoke of in uh, the Emerald Tablets. And that was something that possibly the Enki or, or uh, Enlil's sister did when she carried the seed. If she carried the seed for 10 months and made that alternation to that second uh, gene and added something else in there. That's why you say you notice like a splicing or something that was done Used. to that. Used. You can You can literally see it. If you Google human DNA. Look for the second chromosome. You could see the line between it. It was edited. And, and you know, like I mentioned, that Toth told his guys, you know, to go out and put their mark, you know, on those people. And I, I would wager to guess that that's really where you're going to be seeing um, maybe your Oriental people coming from, um, your Black people coming from, um, uh, like I said, Oriental, the Asian is where you find Spanish people coming from, your European people coming from. And that is that mark. I, I've said numerous times that everything that I say and read, it seems more and more like there are certain spirits or I would say lords, because technically a lord is someone who is designated to a certain amount of land. Right. The and that's what original, the original meaning of lord was loaf giver. Because they were the ones that distributed the bread. The right. word Lord, follow me on this. Follow me on this, Brian. The word Lord, okay, goes back to the 1300s and was the word lard. That's where it comes from. Right. Now, follow me here. Christos in Greek means oil, right? And what is Christos or oil? It is uncongealed lard it is lard in a different set of circumstances so now what is christ christ is the lord in a different set of circumstances the etymology is all there yeah christo in the greek and in fact if you go to your grandma's house i guarantee she's probably got a jar of stuff called crisco yep. up in her cabinet that's all that's all it is and you know what they talk about this too. The interesting thing about the oil too is it's so deeply encoded. I'll just give you an example. So the Bible talks about Jesus walking on water. Well, Jesus is an astrotheological representation of the sun in the sky going through the hero's journey of the 12 zodiac signs and the mythology between it. What Jesus does, or the sun, or Jesus walks on water, but the sun also walks on water. If you've ever seen the sun on a lake, at sunset before if you've ever seen the sun walk on water but here's where it is too it's a triple entendre actually because christ christos in greek means oil now doesn't christos or oil also walk on water when you pour oil onto water right these are triple entendres that they have buried in the bible and no one has any idea well there's so many of these things that mirror each other and doesn't say you know like with the instance of toth sending his people out among the nations that should sound familiar to people if they've done any study regarding like noah's ark and his sons ham shem and japheth 
because what was done with them? They were sent out and given certain areas of land. And, and you'll find uh, different depictions on this, depending on who puts it out there. But it'll look more like North America was given to uh, JPeth, and Europe uh, was given to, say, like Ham, and southern part was given to Shem, something like that. And so and people have tried to say that actually when they came off the ark, they were of like a different color. Something had happened. And they tried to say that that is maybe where the different races came from. But it's like, wait a minute. That's just a retelling of the old, old story from Thoth. This Same is what exact I'm thing. Brian. The Bible is the most incredible deep book that's ever been written because people have over time learned how to encode things. But it's not original and it's not history. And it's not reality. These are archetypes, all of them. What is the story of Samson and Delilah? You have to understand is that anyone that talks to me about the Bible, you have to be able to read and understand Hebrew like I can. Because I'm not going to argue with you over a King James interpretation. Yep. Now, when it comes down to it, okay, what you have to realize is that Samson in Hebrew is Shimshon, and Shimshon in Hebrew means little son, little son. So now what is Delilah? The root word of Delilah is Lila, and Lila in Hebrew means night. When you say goodnight to someone in Hebrew, you say Lila Tov, which literally translates to night good, but it means good night, if you were to translate it word for word. What is the story of Samson and Delilah? Well, she betrays him. He goes blind. It's the story of the night overtaking the sun and sending it to the underworld. The Egyptians had the same thing, too, with Horus and Set. That's why we have a sunset to this day. These are all deeply metaphorically encoded stories that tell stories. Oh, I, you know, I think one of the things that's been done also is that these people that have they've kind of not really put the deception out there but they're like you know what these people aren't even going to read because where's the best place to hide something i hide it in a book you know and the story that you'll get say for instance i reference sunday school one of the stories you'll get since sunday school when it comes to samson delilah was that she cut samson's hair right go back and read it again actually read it she never cut his hair but now here's where it gets even deeper brian why is it so important that Samson loses his power when he loses his hair? There was a story that came out that um, a while back they had some uh, Navajo Indians, I believe it was, right? They grow their hair out long. And when they would go to battle, it would act like a sixth sense that could, um, that could see, that could feel their enemies coming. And what happened when they joined the army, they cut their hair and they lost their power. There is so much wisdom in this book that people don't know how to read it. Yeah, that, that's the exact problem is that, you know, I, I was going to make a statement earlier and I was wondering whether I should make this statement or not. But I was going to make the statement of, you know, when I really started reading and when I really learned how to read, <laughs> because a lot of people think they know how to read, but they don't. They might be able to sound out the words. They might know what the words mean, but they can't conjugate the whole thought right. of the whole situation that's going on at the time w within the writing. You know what I mean? And so, no, no, they're not able to really digest the information that's being put out there. When you really learn how to read, and even like Michael referred to, like the Hebrew, get to know the Hebrew. The Hebrew will make those words come to life because you're going to find a whole bunch more meaning behind something that you thought was just one little simple word. I'll give you an <clears throat> example of one right now. I'll give you an example right now. In the Hebrew text, the commandment says thou shalt not murder. In the English Bible, the King James Bible. It says, thou shalt not kill. There is a very big difference between the word murder and kill. Absolutely. And I want to mention as well to people, because I've had some people make comments before. Uh, tonight I'm wearing a Resident Evil hat. 
it looks like it's got the Knights Templar cross on it. Well, you know what? I've got different hats and shirts like that. I love wearing because it strikes up conversation when you're out in public around people. Because you just don't want to come out and start spouting some of this new brand of crazy to them. You want them to ask you a question, and then it really opens up, and then they really will listen to you and talk with you. And you see the light bulbs start coming off in their eyes of things that they had always known, but they had never really put two and two together, you know. And that's what we need to be doing, you know, with going through and reading some of these much, much older texts in comparison. I, I mean, I remember when I was reading uh, Hermes Trismegistus, and I was reading through that, and I was like, oh, my gosh, Paul lifted some of his words right from this, some of the same phrases, he, because we know he studied at the feet of Gamaliel, and these were the types of things he would have been studying at the time. That's why when he was in, in court, that's why he said to him, that Jesus told him, is it hard for you to kick against the pricks? That's why he said that, because he's well studied. And he knew that came out from the book I play from Greece 500 years earlier. He was going and inserting himself and the Christ into a story. Right. And so well, you've got when those you start. Christians, I mean, you've got those groups of people. Some people um, swear by Paul. Some people think Paul is ruining everything or ruined everything. Um, what do you make of those two? Uh, what do I personally make of Paul regarding those? Yes. Uh, my opinion of Paul has come to that he knew a lot of truth, all right, a whole lot of truth. And, in fact, he tried telling people not to listen to him. He said, if anybody comes to you saying things that are not of you know, the, the words of Yeshua, run from them. And he was trying to tell people, run from me. You know what I mean? But though at the same time, he came from uh, the, the king's court. He came from Herod's court. And so that's where he was getting his letters of agreement for him to go and fight against the followers of the way. If you read Acts 28, he never says that he persecuted Christians. He said he persecuted followers of the way. His message was Christianity. Uh, that's why the king there in that court said to him, oh, you almost won me over to Christianity. Well, if the king was giving him letters, if the church was giving him letters to go in war against this certain group of people, and if they had been the Christians, the king, King Herod, he would have never said that I almost converted to Christianity. He wouldn't have said that at all if those were the people that he was being sent to persecute. He was being sent out to persecute followers of the way, which was what James was teaching, and that was something that was dis disruptive to the state. The state needed be to use religion, and they've always used religion, even up through today, to help uh, mold the people and control the people. Uh, it's even been said that what, religion is the opiate, and so Napoleon said it's the opiate of the people, of the masses. And so it's been used over and over again. And I think the situation with Paul was a perfect example of it being used. So it's interesting that you bring that up too, because you really have to, people think they're putting on the armor of Christ, but what they're doing is they're denying every other science that the Bible is part of so that you can understand it. And it's done that way on purpose. It's to keep you in a fear based system. For example, do you know how in Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9, Jesus calls the Jews the synagogue of Satan? Yeah. Well, they are. But I'm going to explain it to you. They are the synagogue of Satan. All you have to do is go to your favorite internet browser and look up Saturn is Satan. Because Saturn is Satan. Now, the Jewish religion goes back to the worship of Saturnalia. It's why people get ear rings, because Saturn has rings, and because they were told to listen to their god, so they'd get their ears pierced with rings. It's why they wear wedding rings, because you had to pledge your fidelity in front of the god. The god was Saturn. Saturn is Satan. So when Jesus is telling them that the Jews are the synagogue of Satan, that doesn't mean they're evil. 
What it means is that they're the synagogue of Saturn. He's speaking astrotheologically. Jesus disappears at 12 and comes back at 30. And no one can figure out why, but it's really simple. What happens to a young Jewish boy at the age of 12 or his 13th year? Bar mitzvah. Exactly. He becomes a man. So he goes off to study once he becomes a man. He comes back at 30 to start his ministry. He starts teaching at 30. Why 30? The reason he comes back at 30 is because the Jewish religion is a Saturnalia cult. There is a weather system on top of Saturn that's a hexagram. And the cube goes in the middle, the black cube. That's where that comes from. That's why the Jews wear the black cube on their forehead. That's why the Muslims walk around the black cube. It's Saturn worship. And what you'll find is that Saturn, the Saturnalians, the original original Jewish people that worshipped Saturnalia, worshipped Saturn. And they told people that you could not be a teacher. You could not teach until you had a Saturn return. And if you've spoken to any astrologer in your life and asked them about this, Saturn takes 30 years to come back to the same point it was at when you were born. That's why he disappears at 12 and comes back at 30. It's all there. All the information is there. You just have to know how to read it. Well, it- you know, interesting you brought up the 30 year mark as well because there's references to Enlil actually owning a star. And the star sits in the north. And the star, it, it kind of like expands its output and contracts. And it does that every 27 years. Well, what is that famous age that so many actors and, or artists and people die at? They die at 27. In fact, I, I died. That's why I was killed at 27. That's also you know. tied to the demon star, Al Ghul. I don't know if you've ever heard of Al Ghul or Al Ghul. This is right. why the bad guy in Batman was called Raz Al Ghul. It's known as the demon star, Al Ghul. You know, and I'll say something kind of blunt here that a lot of people will probably kick against. But, you know, you talked about the cube on the head, and we we know that they also, you know, wrap the straps around the arm X amount of times. They do all these physical things. And within the churches today, they have you doing all these physical things because for some reason in the weakness of people's minds, they think they actually have to perform something physical and do something physical to make some sort of an effect on the spiritual. But I'm sorry, even if like, you go read Hermes Tremensis, it tells you these physical things, that's all in the carnal. Those are carnal things you're doing. They literally tell you in the Bible. They tell you in the Bible constantly. They tell you in the Quran, the kingdom. They tell you in the book of Thomas saying 77. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is inside you. It's inside you. You do not need to physically do anything. Anything that you think you're doing is warped. I promise you it is misled. It has been tweaked from its original meaning, and you are not doing anything pure. Catholicism is a cult, okay? Getting the blood and the body, that's sacrifice. That's a cult, okay? You look at you look at any of these cults, and they all, and I've said it before, they have three main things that all run through them, blood, water, and oil. You're going to find those three components in all of these cults. Yeah, because these are things that tie into uh, the body, they tie into the physical, they tie into the carnal. And you go, I was going to bring up, you look at Catechism 216, 2116. Yeah, I've talked what, to you about that one before. Yeah, and, it, it, and where it talks, and the Vatican is saying, you know, not to do these certain things. In fact, I wrote a couple of them down, and one I wanted to bring them up. Astrology, by the way. Right. They, they talk about, you know, not following astrology. Um, Palm reading, uh, interpretation of omens, lots, clairvoyance, recourse to mediums, things of that nature. Right. Uh, things that are, uh, for instance, and, and the word that it uses in that catechism is hidden powers. Okay. So hold on a minute. If you're not supposed to do those things, these things that are supposedly hidden powers, then please explain to me what prayer is. What is the laying out of hands? What is baptism? 
What what is inviting some spirit to come and dwell within you? What is circumcision? What is circumcision? That, I mean, are these not accessing supposedly some sort of a hidden power? You know, Yeshua, when he was talking to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus said, how do I become born again? Because Jesus said, you know, you must be born again. He didn't tell Nicodemus, oh, hold on here. Just wait a few months. They're going to crucify me. And after they crucify me and I raise from the dead, then you can believe in my death. You can believe in my resurrection. And then you will be saved. That's not what he said at all. That was not Yeshua's message. That was Paul's message to everybody. What Yeshua was telling everybody, just like you said, he was telling people, I am within you. You are within me. We are one. And so there's no wrong. need for you to be ask, asking some entity inside of you. You know, be careful what entity you're asking inside of you. Who knows what kind of church you're going to? Who knows who they are really following? What is what is the book of Thomas saying 77 say? Split a piece of wood and I am there. Lift up a stone and you will find me. It's mm. it's there. It's everything. Everything look, is a part of God. And look what is at a what blade does, of grass. What does the Quran 532 say? It says, for those of you who have killed a man without him being guilty of manslaughter or some crime, it's as if you have killed all mankind because we're all sharing one consciousness. There's no difference between me and you. The only thing is that different is our five senses and, and how some of them are stronger or weaker than the others. But there's no difference. There's one consciousness. We're all one. There is no separation of humanity from God. And that's the problem with all these religions is they try and make God something separate from you when you are already God on earth, experiencing himself subjectively. That's all it is. Yeah. Jesus had I, it with But Alan I Watts think... talks about it. Alan Watts says Jesus Christ knew he was God. So wake up and find out who you truly are. In the West, they will tell you that you're crazy or that you're insane and they will lock you up in jail or a mental hospital, which is basically the same thing. But if you wake up in India, India, and tell your friends and relations, my goodness, I've just discovered that I'm God, they will say, oh, congratulations, at last you found out. That's Alan Watts. People know this stuff. There is no separation between God and humanity. Everything is metaphorical. Nothing should be taken literally. You have to understand how deeply these sciences are encoded. The wisdom of the world is in these books. And these morons are reading them literally. It's like John Dominic Croissant says. John Dominic Croissant says, it's not that these ancient peoples told literal stories and we're now smart enough to take them symbolically, but actually that they told them symbolically and now we are dumb enough to take them literally. Absolutely. It, uh, since you bring that, I want to remind everybody, Always look in the description box of my videos. I add information and things for you down there. And included down there is some tablets from the Enuma Elish. There is also a link to Micah Dank's channel there as well. And uh, Micah has written, uh, what did you just release, your eighth book a while ago? Yes. All right. And so people will go check that stuff out. And I, I think really what I'm trying to share here in this uh, Sorry, guys. I guess uh, the powers that be, a computer or whatever, decided to kick me off. But as I was saying, this is what I'm trying to share, I think, in this eighth episode of Decoding Churchianity, is that so much is already out there, if we would just read it. We're trying too hard for something that we already have. And the reason why we're trying too hard is because it's being presented to us in an aspect of something that is a control mechanism. And we have to get rid of these control mechanisms that are around us. 
Oh, I appreciate Micah for being here this evening. I think he took off when the uh, internet dropped me, but this was a good chat this evening and something everybody should really stop and think about. You know, the Bible is not the oldest book around. There's books that are thousands and thousands of years older, and they're all telling you the same story. Isn't it amazing that when you go and look at the different religions of the world, they are all telling you the essential same story. They're just using different characters, different names, but it's the same story. Where are they getting it from? They're getting it from these other writings that are 1, 2, 12, 16,000 years older than the scripture that you're looking at. And keep that in mind. And until we meet again here, I hope this gave people something to think about and always try to find, always try to learn who you really are, where you're really from, and where you're really at because you've been deceived on all of those. Good night, everybody. <clears throat> ¶¶